Welcome to all three of you and thank you for making the time to join me today in this lively panel discussion. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you, George Charles. Okay, well, I'm, we just finished a presentation, actually, a 30-minute presentation where I gave everybody, all our viewers, a quick glimpse into what the Napa Valley stands for, you know, the climate, the soils, the terroir, the AVAs, uh, and what the NVV is doing as a body to uplift and enhance the, you know, and all the wonderful work that it's doing for the Napa Valley. But really, I want to know from all three of you, starting with Russ, Silverado is owned by the Walt Disney family. Uh, we'd like to understand from you, why did they move to Napa Valley and why did they found a winery here? What did they see in Napa Valley and why did they want to start a winery here rather than anywhere else, any other region in the world? Tell us about your history in the Napa Valley. Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> I think that's a very familiar story for a lot of people because when you come over that rise, when you get over the Napa River and you turn the corner into the valley proper, the uh, the, the scenery you you know is just so beautiful and it's it's such a jewel box it's this little tiny beautiful jewel and when um, uh, Diane Miller uh, who, who's the daughter of, of Walt Disney when she and her mother uh, first came to the valley in 1975 and rounded that corner she said she was just it took her breath away and so I think Obviously, you know, in the 70s, uh, uh, you know, Californians were becoming very proud of, uh, you know, their culture and, and the things that they were they were doing that were on a on a world class level. And I think one of those was obviously uh, with the with the incredible work of the vintners starting in the 30s, but also with the, you know, with the coming of kind of the modern age and in, in uh, in in Napa with you know great figures like Robert Mondavi uh you know spreading the gospel as it were about Napa uh everybody uh everybody in California became quite energized by our local uh, culture and our local style and I think uh you know wines kind of fit in 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 uh, culture and style and Diane was fascinated with it she had been taking uh, she and her husband Ron have been taking wine classes from a, a, a wine writer, Bob Balzer, who, who was writing for the LA Times at the time. And they had to go see Napa. And when they came around that corner, they were just, they were just absolutely uh, taken aback. And Diane said from that moment, she just had a dream of, of, of starting something in the Napa Valley. So they, they purchased their first vineyard, the Miller Ranch, which makes our Sauvignon Blanc, and, and it's where the family's home is. Uh, in 1976, and then in 1978, they they purchased the iconic Silverado Vineyard, uh, and later in 1981 started making wine uh, and borrowed that name, Silverado Vineyard, for the winery. I love that name, but I'll come back to you on why the name and what what's the history of the of the name from. But Josh, Charles, you're up next. Your family originates from Burgundy. You're French vintner originally from a family of French vintners, and uh, you now live in Napa Valley. So, what did you see in California and Napa Valley, and why did you decide to make start making wines in Napa? And not to draw a direct point of comparison between Burgundy or Napa, but what is it about Napa that 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 kind of entices you uh, or makes you love it more than maybe even Burgundian wines? Well, so now, very similar to what Russ very eloquently has always said, and I know Dan will say as far as the Daryush story, and I would echo it to India. You know, certain countries, certain locations, you are magnetized by it. You know, your vortex of energy is attracted to it and from your root to your third eye. And I use obviously the uh, chakras to bring the image of India that you know I adore. And this is why we have as well a joint venture in your beautiful country that I admire. Because Napa Valley and America at large has this energy that brings you in. That allows you to feel that local terroir, as we call it so well in Burgundy, and allows you to think that everything is possible. So I would go more on a tangent as Walt Disney, who happens to be one of my favorite characters of all time as a creator. Everything is possible and dare to dream. And as Dariush would echo what I would say with Dan and, yeah. and Russ did, because I had the pleasure to meet Russ 
my first visit to Napa Valley. And we had a marvelous lunch thanks to him. And I was looking when he was at Mondavi at the edge of this beautiful hillside, looking at the Vacas and Mayacamas. And I had a dream very similar to the dream that we all have where you feel this is here. This is the place. This is where I want to anchor as well. In addition to my historical background of Burgundy in Rougeau, where I want to anchor as well the continuation of our family. So I think it's a vortex of energy. It's the alignment of all the magnetic forces that brings you to a place. And then that helps you to radiate in a sense that everything comes together. And I think Napa Valley finally as you related to Burgundy, is the same size. When you think about yeah. the close to 50,000 acres of Napa, it's the same as Burgundy. Burgundy. The petitness, this beautiful cleavage where we sit in between Maikamas and Vacas allows us to have diversities of terroir, uniqueness, and a very manageable type of distance between each of us so we together and we all great neighbors, Russ, I could see him from where I am right now. I could see Dan where he is. I'm on Wapo Hill and they are really close neighbors. We're a mile apart and we feel each other. We bring each other's energy. You know, each of those wines that they produce are fabulous. And this friendship that Camaraderie makes what Napa Valley so good. And the welcoming that Russ gave me over 16 years ago now, as well as Dan and Dariush and all of us, makes it so unique that Napa Valley is that place that is, again, very magnetic. Incredible. Thank you for that answer. That's, you know, just, and you make it so relate, <clears throat> excuse me, you make it so relatable. You use words like chakras and, and all of that. So magnificent. Thank you. Well, and so now I would just say one more thing, if you don't Please. mind. No, no. It's the same as when I met you many, many years ago. You have that magnetism, that energy that you drive and that inspiration that makes us be with you today and, and really makes us want to do things in your beautiful country because of what you attract, you represent and you magnetize within us to want to bring Napa Valley and California at large to one of the best country on the planet, one of the most admired country on the planet, that is India. JC, thank you so much. You're always so kind with your praise, so generous. And I am fully aware, but our viewers should know how early in the morning it is in Napa Valley. It is quarter to eight in the morning. So I'm so grateful that you've all made the time. I know you all have an early start anyway, but this is particularly very early especially you know we didn't go to bed we were all partying last night together having <laughs> wine and we said we might as well stay with the ego yeah well now i'm jealous but 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 to make it worth your while you should all i should also let you know that we have over five thousand viewers who are live listening to right. us right now yeah that's yeah. the exact number Bravo. tells me so that we've been able to do um yeah we this has been a really successful summit for us and and this yeah. is the crescendo this is the last session of this summit uh and we've made sure we've built up all the momentum to get to the crescendo tonight so thank you again for for, for all of you uh, for joining tonight. Um, Dan, I do want to know from you the same as because it's particularly so uh, so fascinating to know that Dariush uh, Kaledis was born and raised in Iran. So the history of Dariush where why yeah. started from, you know, as a relocation from Iran, moving yes. to the US as a young person. And then how did he find his way to the Napa Valley? It's almost like the American dream. So tell us about the history, your history in the valley. Yeah, no, very, very much so. And I'm glad that uh, Jean Charles uh, spoke the way he did. You know, Dariush was born in Iran. And, and of course, Iran and, and India have so much history together uh, and so much influence and so much trading of uh, cultures and, and business even uh, several thousand years ago. Um, Dariush uh, was raised and, and, and ended up becoming a civil engineer in Iran. And while he um, likes engineering, he's a little bit more of an entrepreneur and he has great passion in the world. And he started a engineering company in the late 60s in Tehran, building roads and tunnels and while Iran was industrializing at that time. And he was quite successful, but 
you know, I think he always had this very strong passion or desire for more freedom and more opportunity than was available in Iran in the mid 70s. So he emigrated in 1975 to Los Angeles. Uh, he did not speak English. He just had a, you know, an idea and a dream and a, a lot of passion in his heart uh, to become an American and to be a very successful entrepreneur. Um, he could not be a engineer in America because he didn't speak English and didn't have a license. So he ended up buying a small uh, grocery store in Los Angeles and I'll skip forward, but 20 years later, he owns 44 supermarkets throughout California. Wow. He owns the largest family owned grocery uh, uh, store in the state. And he found great success and great opportunity uh, by working hard and, and being clever and, and, and following his dream and not being discouraged, which is what we all should do in life. And so um, parallel to his you know, entrepreneurial success, uh, Darish has always been a, uh, a very enthusiastic collector of Bordeaux. And his dream um, was to own a property in Bordeaux. And when his grocery empire became successful enough that he could truly consider buying a property, he did a lot of research in uh, Bordeaux, but ultimately decided to come to Napa Valley. And I think what he was inspired, you know, clearly Napa and Bordeaux have a lot going for them. Um, and the differences are sometimes significant in terms of climate and wine style and things like that. But for Dariush in Napa Valley, he felt like he could come to an area that was still had things to prove, still had, you know, uh, uh, opportunities for for pioneers and, and, and new ideas and uh, independent thinkers like Dariush is naturally. And he came and purchased a property in southern Napa Valley, south of Stag's Leap. We're about two miles south of Russ. Uh, and, you know, the vineyard was planted to Chardonnay, which is a Burgundian grape. And Dariush replanted that to uh, Bordeaux varieties because he was such a Bordeaux fan. And since that time, uh, over the last 15 years that I've worked for Dariush, we've acquired uh, four different vineyards throughout Southern Napa Valley, um, Oak Knoll Appalachian, uh, Coombsville Appalachian. And then we're, our wines are highly influenced by Mount Veeder as well. And right. so, you know, we have our own uh, vision for what we're looking for in our wines. Um, we appreciate style. Uh, I hope that your, your uh, uh, listeners are, have seen Dariush on the website and look at his story because I think they will find a lot in common with his passion and his uh, desire and his love of wine. So that's a good start. That's a great start. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I'm particularly inspired by this, uh, you know, wanting to Bordeaux and then ending up with Napa instead and then making such a, such a great success story. Uh, you know, out of it. Um, I do want to touch upon something that I get to hear a lot as a professional, but uh, there's this whole opinion, a general opinion in the in, among wine enthusiasts or travelers, or I would say mostly consumers who tend to feel that all of Napa Valley cabs, Cabernet Sauvignons are the same. You know, it, they kind of tend to be stylistically similar. Personally, for me, when I was in Napa Valley two years ago, and we tasted a lot of them, yes, you tend to get some sort of a commonality, but increasingly, I find that Cabernet Sauvignons of Napa Valley are changing, they're evolving, they're they're kind of also getting more elegant. They're, I mean, not to say they weren't earlier, don't get me wrong, but there there is a conscious effort to change the style, to make them lighter, maybe more. I just want to know your comments and anybody can take this question. Maybe, uh, um, you know, maybe, maybe Dan or, or JC, actually, actually, any of you three could take that. Yeah. What are your comments about the style of Cabernet Sauvignon of Napa Valley being what it is and what inspires the style to be what it is? And is it undergoing a change and for what reason, if so? Well, speaking, speaking for Dariush, you know, I, and I won't speak for, for Napa in general, but, you know, Dariush is a man of great style and great individuality, uh, and, as is Russ and, and Jean Charles. Uh, but for Dariush, he's always wanted to take his own path, sort of the path less, less you know, taken, so to speak. Um, and for him, you know, 
crafting wines that have a style that is very unique, that is gracious, that has a seamlessness. Uh, for us, we I'm not critical uh, at, in any way of the style of wines coming out of Napa for the last 50 or 70 years, but we have found or we have pursued a strategy by which we're acquiring vineyards that we think are going to add a very unique and distinctive style. I would say that Dariush um, has a lot of European style in his tastes. He obviously has a gigantic portfolio of Bordeaux in his cellar. Um, so we are looking for what I would call a seamlessness, a graciousness, um, you know, but it's a personal choice on whether you like more fruit or less fruit. Uh, Napa has a great opportunity to make very complex wines and what you choose to feature or highlight is really up to the um the property so yes for us we we try to bring a little bit more grace into our wines or more complexity rather than just ripeness um but but that's where that this is where napa is uh uh and from a climactic standpoint yes and so now Josh, what about you maybe you want to share a little bit about the magic of rutherford <laughs> with our viewers y yes uh, and and I'm so glad you're asking these questions because I really believe when we look at the history of the last 40 years in Napa Valley, we see maybe three tranches, three different sequences of style. And, you know, coming obviously from Burgundy myself and having had the experience of Pinot Noir specifically, I was always looking for eloquence, finesse and refinement. So today, as we own Raymond Vineyards, that is a really vibrant, you know, winery in Rutherford and Santa Lina, as well as Buena Vista winery, very anchored as well in Rutherford, Santa Lina, as well as Yonville. We really have decided to take a stand over the last 11 years of finesse with power. So we really moved away dramatically from the high alcohol level, high ripeness and high tannic structure. We want integration. The obvious word is always balance, but balance with power, because the power underlies into the soil of Napa Valley in America. So you're not trying to make a right bank or even a left bank. You're making a Napa Valley wine. And for us, you know, fortunately, we have over 30 wineries in our collection. Each of them needs to have a purpose, a raison d'être, a reason to exist. And that reason to exist is to be able to stand on its own. And I think Napa Valley, luckily today, has created itself such a name, but besides a name, a style that speaks volume, that speaks with the energy of that local flavor, that is Napa. So I don't think we ever need to need to try to emulate Bordeaux Anybody, or yeah. the Russian River Burgundy. We need to be our own identity, which is for us, from Rutherford to Santa Lina to Stag's Leap to Oakville, and as well, very much so Yonville, to attempt to be refined, eloquent, balanced, but with lingering velvety power that you would not necessarily find in a Bordeaux. So I would like to add, as the Frenchman here on the group, maybe an additional je ne sais quoi to Napa Valley that the people in Bordeaux maybe don't have and i would recommend all our listeners and all our friends to not compare anymore napa valley to bordeaux it's its own personality its own level and in many ways much higher pedigree so i know i'm going to have a hard time when i fly back to france and people hear what i just said but i really would insist on that napa valley could be in many instances much more charismatic with a greater identity and much more you know force within its roots all the way to its ethereal compassionate statement than bordeaux can so go napa valley yeah. amazing thank you um i agree with you i but you know to be fair i think when when i think about the indian audiences and i hope i'm right when i say this and i speak on behalf of everybody but i think to a lot of indians especially who enjoy good wine good life 
uh, I think for us Napa Valley anyway is very distinctive. I think we enjoy a very close nexus with the with California anyway because we we travel a lot to the US. We enjoy our holidays in the US. We travel a lot to San Francisco if for nothing we come for the shopping. Oh, our children study at universities in California and across the Americas. So a lot of for our, for a lot of us Indians our second homes are also based in the US. So invariably because we tend to come a lot to California, a lot to San Francisco, sort of, you know, a lot of us Indians end up visiting Napa Valley, discovering Napa Valley, the taste of Napa Valley. And I think we all have you, I get more of why is there more Napa Valley available in India all the time more than this is like that or this is not like that you know i don't think indians uh, indians as a, as a market is trying to draw that comparison i do have some questions on that but rus i would like you to tell us rus what you feel about uh the style of the silverado uh, vineyard wines uh, the cabernet sauvignon in particular or any other wine that you please what what yeah the i think yeah uh, well, first of all, I want to make the remark, Jean Charles, are, are you the best or what? I, it's unbelievable. It's why you ask, you know, if you need a crescendo, it's why you ask Jean Charles to join us because he's, uh -huh. he, he is the, he is crescendo personified. Uh -huh. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you, Wes. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. Great to see you, by the way. Uh, anyway, uh, listen, you know, Jean Charles mentioned uh, uh, a thing and I, I want to take a thing that Dan mentioned and, and, and that John Charles mentioned and kind of put them together because historically, I think, you know, you were, you were about to say Jean Charles that, that there were uh, some phases of Napa Valley in terms of winemaking. And I was privileged enough to work for, uh, brother Timothy at the Christian brothers. Uh, I, I don't know, sometime after the French revolution, that's how I, old I am. And, uh, and, you and kept we, your head were up, <laughs> we were obsessed with making sure that we didn't have any faults in the wine. Do you know, we were a young, a, a young valley and we were, we were worried about making wines that were clean and perfect. And so I think in, in you, if you think of those wines in the seventies and, and into the early eighties, uh, we were really, really trying to make sure everything was really good. Uh, not, not nuanced necessarily, but just didn't without any faults. Okay. And I think over time, then, then we've relaxed a little bit. We've, we, we, we've, we've kind of relaxed into where we are and who we are. And then what you see is these explorations like, like Dan said of, st of individual style. And we have a tremendous amount of folks who, who are exploring individual styles, which is really changing who we are as Napa Valley. And then I think in terms of, you know, the family that I work for, we've relaxed into individual sites. So we are making wines at, at the vineyard level and the block level. And in terms of, of uh, Silverado, maybe because of a historic accident, we're making wines at the clone level. In other words, we have a selection Massal on our site of Cabernet that's totally unique in the world that was created starting in the 1960s and over a 30 year period became its own unique Cabernet that UC Davis recognized as a heritage clone we're one of three in the valley, but there are more folks doing massal selections now than ever before because we understand now that a vine can adapt to its individual site. And, and, and of course, we're we're very proud to have an individual historic one that's that's recognized in the in the vine catalog. And we make solo from that as an expression of a single clone. But I think it's rather than talk about what that means to Silverado, I, I just want to highlight what that means for the Napa Valley, that folks are really digging into the interaction over time of plant material on a site with human decision making that has, to, to John Charles' point, no reference to any other growing region. It's a the reference is to what we're doing absolutely in the moment uh, in, in on, on these beautiful sites. And I think one of the reasons there's so much camaraderie in the valley is that that, that exploration of whether you're high up on a mountain on the east or whether you're under the fog line in a foothill on the west side or whether you're by the river, wherever you are, because of the amazing diversity of climate and soil here, you are in by definition, you are in a unique spot in the Napa Valley. Yes. And so we're Very not so worried. We're not so worried about like, oh, well, my wine tastes like Dan's wine or I'm, I, I'm totally untroubled by that. You know, we, yeah. we are obviously going to make super unique wines now. And I think we really that's the new phase that we're in is really 
going deeply into our individual sites. Yeah. I love this phase and I love how you put it and I love the idea of how from the 80s when you're all you were trying to create is fall free wines there came a there, there came a, a phase of just effortlessness set in and you know this this innate confidence that just kind of comes and the confidence operates at two levels once the grape variety or the wine plant itself gets confident on its own soil and then the person making the wine also kind of has a sense of ease and effortlessness about you know driving that passion and how the both come together to create something extraordinary i love how you sort of yeah. describe that process i mean uh, there's a hell of a lot of other regions i can think of right now in the world who need to reach that that point of inflection um but it's 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 a wonderful story uh there was a lot about cabernet sauvignon we just spoke about but if i were to ask each one of you because there's so much diversity of styles grape varieties coming out of napa valley today so if cabernet sauvignon is the king of napa valley if it all it is for you then who's the queen for each one of you and why what is the second grape variety after napa valley uh, or, or, or rather Uh, after cabernet sauvignon that thrills you or excites you or you feel um really like sort of charged about wow well i'll start if you want uh i, I was just going to say let, let me let me transition from from russ talking about different decades i i want every one of your viewers to realize that you know wine making is a lifetime pursuit uh and you know Nap has been at it for over 100 years easily but really the last 40 years we've really come into the international scene um and the th the reason why things take so long is that you know vines age and change and it takes time to experiment with different clones on different sites you know and it's all about the pursuit of making better and better wines and sometimes that takes a decade of experimentation sometimes you realize that that particular clone is not going to work and so you try something different or you try a, a new uh, a variety and you have to wait another 10 years for that vine to mature to really see what uh, the the wine tastes like so this is a very slow process um and it takes a lifetime of, of dedication to 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 really find uh, uh who you are as a person and what your what your vineyards can stand for and you know Dariush is now 22 years old and in our pursuit of of experimentation and of acquiring vineyards in many different diverse uh, sub appellations in Napa you know we've really become quite well known for some of these I'll call them I don't know if they, we call them the the queen variety but but alternative varieties that are a little less well known or a little less praised like cabernet franc um or I'll even add to merlot on its own um and for us you know Dariush being a uh, a uh, a persian and having grown up in shiraz iran we have a we have a magnificent uh, uh shiraz or syrah that we grow on our estate about a mile west of where i'm at right now in oak knoll and on that on that uh, uh vineyard we also have a great viognier which is another rhone uh, uh clone so i can't say from all of those that you know this one's better than another but but the winery it, it, over the last 20 years has really become known for cabernet sauvignon with a particular um you know uh, uh, uh reputation for viognier syrah cabernet franc some of these more unusual varieties okay well i was going to say i'm i'm going to let you name all your babies but then you have to choose a baby but but uh... I, i would probably i would probably choose a uh, uh, viognier or shiraz uh simply because shiraz has this sort of cultural history for Dariush if yes. if he was here um that's what he would be talking about but uh it's tough to pick sometimes you know I, there's a lot of exciting things that now that we're in our, our our third decade we're just now getting to the point where we've really fine-tuned our wine style and there's there's a lot to be uh, said and discovered with Dariush yeah sure sure JC what are the different grape varieties and styles that that Uh, wine lovers can enjoy from Raymond or yes or, or Buena Vista I would I would probably echo obviously Dan very articulate answer on the grape specifics I won't go to the specifics of the grape I'm going to stay on the style front and I believe uh, the art of blending 
is what really makes a wine region unique. And the antithesis, obviously, of Burgundy, where you speak vineyard-specific, rose-specific. So what I'm a big admirer of Napa Valley is the alchemy of the grapes. Whether we assemble Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, as Dan, you said, which is obviously a phenomenal evolution and one of my favorite. We've seen a lot of great varieties disappear in Bordeaux for all the climate change we know have occurred. Petit Verdot is one, Malbec is another, and many others. I think we will see the same over time in Napa Valley. I think the key, and we've done that with Buena Vista on a proprietary blend that was created by the Count of Buena Vista in 1861 in Napa Valley with Charles Krug. So you're talking about over 155 years ago now, at the time when Napa Valley got started. Yeah. And I really believe we're going back to this so now, as you and I are passionate about history and really passionate about going back in time and time coming back at the right time. Sure. And I think we need to give time, time for Napa Valley to blossom and really create wines that are not just varietal specific. I think we went through that phase, which is good. And Cabernet obviously was a great place yeah. to identify ourselves as a niche. But as we all will compose, and Russ will tell us about some amazing varieties that he grows on his hill, is the fact that the alchemy of the blend, the art of composition, makes it very specific. And as you know, so now we're doing it at Jenun with our very good friend, you know, Laura. Sekri in Maharashtra. And with Jenun, this is a composition of six great varieties. We want to sell Jenun from India, not just Cabernet Sauvignon. So my big suggestion is to be open-minded to the art of blending that brings that style that I've described before. And it could be Cabernet, it could be Petit Verdot one year, it could be maybe more with Cabernet Sauvignon with a growing interest again for Merlot. Merlot is very seductive in Napa Valley, it's very refined, brings that level of finesse nice. and lace in a blend that is, you know, the beautiful charm, Sonal, as I look at your beautiful eyes, I'm transported to the world of India. I'm imagining a beautiful dance with you. And this is what Merlot does to the blend. So I would give it a chance to go on proprietary blend, on any blend that Napa Valley speaks, because a blend allows you, like Dan, you mentioned, you know, you talked about Shiraz and 6,800 years ago, your or you know, which is seven to nine great varieties. The mm -hmm. alchemy of the blend allows you consistency, reliability, and obviously a style that you can establish over time. <laughs> So, Sonal, are we dancing? Yes, I was just going to say, let's stop imagining about the dancing and let's just make it happen. I wish I wish international travel would just open up. But, Russ, yeah. unless you wanted to take the same question, I did want to ask, because uh, Jean Charles is obviously already a collaborator for the Indian market, and I'm more interested in knowing uh, from you and Dan about... Uh, what is it that you... How do you see the Indian market? We did a wonderful seminar last week on uh, the Indian wine market. I don't know whether you were part of it, but I sort of spent some time uh, sort of sharing some some information about the Indian market. But generally, what's your, what's your vision? What's your understanding? And more than that, what's your expectation from the Indian market? How do you see the Indian market at all? From you and Dan, please. Yeah, let me... Uh... Uh, let, let me go backwards before I go forwards, because uh, I, I think that the if you think about Silverado and how excited we are about Cab Franc, yes. Dan mentioned it, John Charles mentioned it. John, John Charles started. John Charles mentioned Marlowe, I think. Yeah, uh, we 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 do all that, but we're absolutely enamored of our. So maybe it's our our maybe the you know, the, the queen of Napa Valley, as you said, but enamored of our Mount George Vineyard, which was first planted to Cabernet Franc and Cabernet in 1868. So, you know, Jean Charles, you mentioned pedigree and you mentioned energy. And I, I, I think those come together in that kind of a scenario. Uh, I love the energy in the wine of Cab Franc. It has this tremendous purity and energy. And I think that's, that's great. But I just wanted, I just wanted to 
I just wanted to say that Napa isn't always all about that. So I just wanted to throw everybody listening a little bit of a curveball. You asked for the king. I may be giving you the court jester because uh, I was up pretty early this morning. We're, we're getting ready to bottle. Uh, and so I was actually tasting wine a little bit before I, I came on here. And it was uh, actually Kerner. So we've actually planted that little offshoot of, of Riesling that's in, in the, the Sud Tyrol uh, up on our Soda Canyon property and now are making a <clears throat> delicious spicy white wine called Kerner uh, here in the Napa Valley. And I don't think that, I think you have to really relax into a site and relax into your style uh, when you when you plant something that has never before been planted in Napa. And I don't yeah. mean to say that as a Silverado thing. I just mean, to, we're not unique. I, I run across so many of my friends now who are experimenting with so many wonderful different varieties, you know, Sauvignon Vert and 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 the resurgence of Chenin Blanc. And and so it's not just about Cabernet, it's not just about red, it's also about white wines, and it's also about this tremendous variety that's that's happening that is so exciting right now in the Napa Valley. I'm so glad, I'm so excited you shared about Cabernet Franc. I must admit, I, I'm to blame. I've never really personally paid attention. To Cabernet Francs from Napa Valley, but I will do going forward. I will yeah, you should. You pay more attention. It's incredible. But and it's so incredible that all three of you mentioned a different way to sort of look at the whole thing or or approach that question. Um any I'm just conscious of the time and I know Connor said to me you should not go over 40 minutes, but I do want to know um about what your expectation is from the Indian market and why, what about in, being an Indian market excites you? And then I'll share with you a little bit about what we're doing with your Shah's wines in India. Yeah, well, I well, I mean, first of all, you know, for Silverado, we, we've always been the, the sneak attack, you know, on the Indian market. We, we've sold through our our agency in Singapore to the duty free market in India and, and quite successfully over time. Um, you know, uh, I loved how you commented that India is just so much like the United States in so many ways, because each, you know, each state has its own rules and its own approach to alcohol and its own regulatory environment, its own tax environment. And it's, you know, it is a, an amazingly complex uh, market to operate in. And I think often folks look at that and they and, and they look at it very much, you know, if you're importing into the United States, it's very similar, like who you need partners and, and maybe you need more than one and, and it's it's such a vast market. What I what I love about it is it's it's demographic and limitless potential. I mean it feels like it, you know Jean Charles mentioned that about sort of the limitless potential of making wine here on the western edge of the continent. Uh, I, I really feel like the market in India has this limitless potential. Um, not not for all the regular sort of marketing reasons, but because because every culture has its own approach to what is delicious, and and so every every synergy between what we do crafting what we think is delicious will have an interesting combination with what Indian consumers will think is delicious, and I really don't have an expectation about that. I'm just excited by it. I'm excited by. Uh, all of those combinations occurring. We're so small right now as Napa in India, but I think that the potential is just uh, awesome and and the potential for having a really delicious journey together is awesome. Incredible. Thank you. Yeah. That's a yeah. very exciting answer. Dan, how about you? Well, you know, it's very simple for for uh, for Daryush. We're, we're a very small winery. Um, we sell most of our wines here at the winery in Napa Valley. Uh, I, I, our, our goal is simply to find passionate wine collectors, great restaurants, sommeliers that are looking for, uh, you know, smaller wineries that are making specialty wines, uh, that have a, a singular voice that are exceptionally well made. And so, you know, I oversee our international sales, uh, and we're in about 15 countries. Uh, this, these are smaller volumes, but from, uh, you know, Tokyo to Toronto, to the UK, to Singapore, uh, to Sweden, uh, we've, we've found some great partners, um, that are interested in having a, a small amount of Dariush for their collectors. Uh, so I, 
you know, we are not currently in, in India. I am looking for an importer. I'm looking for a small importer with, you know, uh, uh, that would fit our, our, our needs. Uh, this is not about scale for us. This is about finding passionate wine collectors that, that, that will appreciate not only our Cabernet Sauvignon, but wines like our Viognier and Shiraz, which I think would go great with Indian cuisine. Um, and I look forward to traveling there someday to make the presentation. So we'll oh, see. Such a mm -hmm. great heartfelt connection you just made. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Josh Charles, my prediction is that in the next five years, you will be prime minister of India. Um, <laughs> but in the in, but in the interim, what are you going to do in India? Will you tell or which should I? Well, you should say it. Um, I'm you know, I'm obviously bullish and I will put it to the Indian people. Very importantly, the Indian culture from its diversity of color, sense, senses and attitude and beliefs is living a philosophy of life that welcome any flavor, that welcome absolutely anything from around the world with a smile. Therefore, I believe the wine world hasn't yet started, but is doomed to boom in the future because people have the understanding of taste and flavor and have the understanding of this incredible diversity that you speak so well because everybody should go on Sonal Instagrams and WhatsApp and Facebook, probably one of the best in the world of wine. And you speak about it so well in such a great way that I'm enamored every time I go to India, as you know, it could be north, south, east or west. I'm in love with the country, more importantly, in love with the people. And the people have a very, very strong understanding of flavor. So I'm bullish, whether it's fine wine, whether it's entry level wine, whether it's sweet wine, rich wine, whatever it is, India will be prompt to enjoying wine with the great food it has. And very fortunately, this incredible diversity of food that welcome Rhone Grey Vardis, as Dan said, Napa Valley, as Russ said, Burgundy, as we can imagine, to the Loire Valley, to the Sancerre, to the German and Austrian Rieslings and Grüner Wettlinger. I think the spectrum is so wide that we are discovering Indian food and I've never been so excited. So now as we've done in your beautiful home with your family and your daughter to many of our friends all across India tastings where people as well are curious. And I think the key in any nation, as America has been over the last 50 years, India is a collection of very intelligent people, curious people who are daring to try, daring yeah. to experience, daring to go there to the frontier that they don't necessarily know to really gain an additional flavor. And that's why I'm excited about it because the moment someone has rusts and Dan and Daryush and yourself is open intellectually to welcome new taste and flavor, we have achieved the first step of discovery. And I think the openness yeah. of what Indian people are to embrace others with a smile, with that beautiful smile that really characterize India with those beautiful colors and that peacefulness of mind is welcoming the wine world. So I'm absolutely bullish. And now it's all you, Sonal, to tell everybody what we're doing. Well, well, firstly, I want to say, how can that not open anybody's, all of their chakras? I mean, yes. not anybody, how can anybody resist that charm? Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful words uh, about India, about me. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm humbled. Uh, well, I just couldn't resist. I, I couldn't resist. I had to, uh, you know, jump into my, you know, put on an extra hat and start becoming an importer. I couldn't resist importing. So I recently uh, started importing Buena Vista wines, part of the Boise collection. Yay! And they're being, they're being cleared even as I speak. And uh, yeah, well, Raymond's still up for takes, but I think I might block that too. 
I might block anybody else from you coming. Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but thank you. But I'm very excited. I'm excited because this is my first wine that I'm going to start importing in India. But I think India is a is an exciting market, as Dan correctly said. Uh, uh, you know, Russ is equally excited. This is a, this is a market which has which is growing. It's still nascent, but there's a lot of very discerning um, people. who are really curious and passionate about good wine uh and for those few that are really seeking good excellence quality high quality i think i can think of no better fit than the napa valley so any importer who is looking to build a direct to consumer sort of a connection or has the ability to create a a, a very exciting sort of a dialogue directly with consumers some of any of your wineries would be an excellent excellent fit for any of such you know sort of partners in india and uh, you you've shared such wonderful stories with us today i can't thank you enough um russ you've been very uh, uh, i think you've been very um uh, well i don't know what the word is but you said it took 40 years uh, to sort of make all this transformation and it's been so slow uh i think you're being very harsh actually because i think 40 years is very less time and if you see the the journey that napa valley has made from where it was to where it is today my god what a transformation it's been i mean if if some other regions around the world in 40 years could be where napa valley is today that what a what a success story so my hearty congratulations and you know i talked earlier in the presentation about community and collaboration and camaraderie but i may as well have left it for this presentation because it was so evident between all three of you it's just live there for all of india right now to see so my you know it's it, my heartfelt congratulations and uh, and best wishes to all three of you as well as napa valley vintners for this stellar opportunity this and sanal thank you to you, thank you. um you know as you know russ paved the way many years and has done an amazing amazing job russ thank you for all what you do always beyond silverado for napa valley at large as well as you dan very impressive and so now there's no one better than you as a prime minister uh there's <laughs> yes. no one more charming and a oh. prime minister who toast with the guest as you know um fred Ryan just finished a book on the White House and I'm pleased to tell you though that your prime minister is uh, enjoying some of the Genoon wines at the White House and has before. So the good news is you already have a prime minister who enjoys wine so if you become the next prime minister which I will vote for you as you know I have a a voting right in India. I become the prime minister then God save in mm-hmm. india because then we're going to have zero tax on wine for sure right yeah. everything is going to be free right. market so but i on that very optimistic note um thank you so much tonight thank you so much guys so now you're terrific thank you very much thank you so much really i'll see you all very soon all right. all right we'll see you soon yes, thank you no doubt excellent thank you